So we're going to start chapter three. Uh, specifically, the chapter focuses in on the prokaryotes. This includes the bacteria and to a lesser extent the archaeans. Um, we won't hit the archaeans that much, but we will talk a lot about the bacteria. A little rehash to start with about the difference between the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes. Um, again, okay. prokaryotes, uh, DNA packaged within the cytoplasm, no nucleus, no histone proteins with the DNA wrapped around it. Uh, the cell wall made up of pepsidoglycan, a carbohydrate, but not the same thing that you find in eukaryotic cell walls. Uh, internally, no membrane-bound organelles. Remember, we're going to see lots of cytoplasm uh, with that DNA bundled up on the inside. There will be ribosomes. Ribosomes are a requirement of all living organisms. They are not membrane-bound organelles. Okay. Why are we going to talk about this? Why focus on what the bacteria look like? Well, this is going to play an important role in what we call the five requirements of infection. In other words, these five steps that organisms will have to go through or five steps that a pathogen must actually establish themselves in in order to cause infection. Uh, the first one, entry or getting in, establishment or staying in. Now, your book uh, divides establishment into attachment and defeating the host defenses. I'm going to call establishment uh, sort of an attachment uh, all one thing. The third step, defeating the host defenses. And what we mean here is overcoming the immune system, uh, finding a way to not be removed from the body or destroyed by the host. Uh, fourth, damaging the host. If it doesn't do damage, it's not necessarily disease-causing. Uh, in some instances, these are how we acquire things like normal microflora, and we don't worry about them. And fifth, being transmissible. In other words, these organisms would like to eventually have either themselves or their offspring move on to a new host. Okay? Uh, as we go through this chapter, be on the lookout for what are called virulence factors, um, any structure that helps fulfill the five requirements of infection. And what you'll find out is that a lot of structures will actually fulfill multiple requires of in, requirements of infection. That's not uncommon. So note that this is not a one structure, one requirement relationship. You can have one structure that fulfills multiple requirements. Okay, so throwing a list out here, this is by no means something that you need to memorize, um, but familiarize yourself with it. So, general structure. All bacteria will have a cell membrane, cytoplasm, ribosomes, a cytoskeleton, and DNA that comes in one or a few chromosomes. Uh, the reality is all living cells will possess pretty much these things as well. Uh, most bacteria will also have a cell wall and a surface coating called a glycocalyx. Okay. If you have no idea what some of these are, don't worry about it. We're going to cover them later. And actually one by one. Now, some but not all bacteria possess, and, and this can be in any order. Some bacteria can have several of these or one of these. Uh, it just depends upon the organism. Um, Flagella, pili, and fimbriae. Most of you are probably familiar with flagella, uh, but pili and fimbriae are probably a little out of your realm as of right now. Um, an outer membrane that depends upon the type of bacteria you're dealing with. Plasmids, inclusions, and endospores. Okay. So, <clears throat> if you recall that eukaryotic uh, cell that we looked at, uh, here is the prokaryotic cell. Notice that there are a lot fewer components. Uh, these aren't just lines with words beside them. Uh, we actually have directional lines for labeling and not only uh, a statement about what the line is pointing to, but a short definition in there. Okay? Uh, giving some function in with the structure. I, like, I really, really enjoy this picture. So 
uh, prokaryotic shapes and arrangements. Now, most prokaryotes exist as unicellular organisms. It is possible that we see some of them surviving in biofilms or colonies. For the most part, these organisms are completely fine living independently. They just happen to be situationally in a biofilm. Okay. On average, prokaryotic cells are around a micrometer. They can be much, much smaller than that, and we consider those organisms nanobes. Uh, they're much more likely going to be measured in the nanometer range. Um, all the way up to the recent discovery of a really large bacteria. Um, <clears throat> that's about 750 micrometers. Uh, this is a symbiote of sturgeon fish called Epulopisculum fishelsoni. Uh, its discovery kind of turned microbiology on its head because we had never seen a bacteria that large to have one cell be that huge. Uh, realistically, you could see this with the naked eye uh, if you knew specifically to look for it. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, the shape and arrangement of bacteria is termed morphology. We went over a lot of morphological characteristics in lab. Uh, these are commonly used to help identify organisms and <clears throat> we sort of start separating organisms based on their morphology. Uh, again, we see a lot of this in lab. You guys have started to do this already. Um, it is possible for cells of a single species, in other words, they're all the same thing, to actually vary in size and shape. So we can see the same bacteria, but some of the cells are pleo are caucus while the others are bacillus. Uh, this is termed pleomorphism, with that pleo meaning several or many. It's a variation on poly. And then morphism like morphology. So we're talking about having several shapes. Um, now, don't be fooled. This is not something that exists in our lab. All of the organisms we have have a very specific and definite shape and arrangement. Do not try to use the term pleomorphic as a lab indicator. So, uh, bacterial shapes, again, you're familiar with the coccus bacteria. These are mainly considered spherical. Uh, we do see some of them as a sort of oval and bean shape. Uh, again, for our purposes in lab, they're completely spherical. Uh, bacillus bacteria, do not use the term rod in lab. I know your book does it, but we're going to call them bacillus bacteria. Uh, <clears throat> Vibrio, or the collar shape, or the comma shaped organisms, excuse me. Uh, Spirillum okay, and spirochetes. Okay. Uh, the spirillum and spirochetes both sort of winding around an axis, if you will recall. Spirillum cells has a tendency to sort of zigzag up and down. When we see these, we very often see shorter ones on a nice S-curve. The spirochetes have a tendency to coil like a corkscrew. Okay. Uh, to be honest, this in itself can be a virulence factor. Uh, having that corkscrew shape and the ability to burrow into tissues uh, helps to establish and damage uh, and fulfilling those two requirements of infection. Okay. Now, when it comes to arrangements, okay, so all of these shapes, when it comes to the arrangements, arrangements are an artifact of the bacteria dividing and not separating completely apart from one another. Uh, you can see it here, this caucus on a single plane of division. Okay. Uh, it continues to divide on this plane over and over and over and over again. That is how we end up with bacteria that are streptococcus. Remember, strepto means chains. Pen's not working for me today. Um, division on two planes. This is how we get tetrads or sarcinae, where the tetrads actually divide and end up on top of one another. Okay. And then division on several planes gives us clusters of cells. If you remember, we called this staphylo. Uh, this is exclusive to the coccus bacteria. Remember, bacillus bacteria do not do staphylo arrangements. So let's start externally and talk about a couple of these structures. Uh, the flagella, for example, 
Uh, these are often termed prokaryotic propellers. Okay? Uh, their main focus here is bacterial locomotion. They're moving the bacteria around. Uh, we call this motility. Okay. Uh, there are three distinct parts to bacterial flagella that actually has to help anchor them into the bacteria. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> this, your book is terming it a basal body. Uh, some books will also term it an anchor. Okay. A hook, sort of a 90 degree there. And then the filament, the flagella itself. Okay. So filament, hook, and then the anchor that's attaching it into the cells. Now, these are mainly made of proteins, specifically proteins like flagellin. Uh, these do not have that sort of fish swim movement, okay? that back and forth movement that you see in videos of things like sperm. Uh, prokaryotic flagella do not sway side to side. I like a fishtail. Instead, the prokaryotic flagella actually rotate around that hook, okay, uh, like propellers do. Uh, because of this, they don't have as much control over their movement, okay, and they're a little bit more limited in their ability to sort of direct themselves. Okay. Uh, arrangements of flagella, we see monotrichous flagellum. If you don't know, mono means one, uh, trichous means hair. Okay. So monotrichous flagella, that would be this guy right here, so A. Okay. Uh, lophotrichous, lopho means tuft or spot. Okay. So there here we have a patch of hair. Okay. So these are lophotrichous. Okay. Uh, amphitrichous, amphi on either side, okay. uh, like amphibolic reactions that run both catabolic and anabolic pathways. Okay. So here we see amphibolic flagella. Okay. I'm sorry, amphitrichous flagella. Okay. And then peritrichous, uh, flagella that sort of extend randomly over the surface of the cell. So, let's see, and then this would be D, okay, uh, peritrichous flagella. Now, honestly, you're not going to see flagella through the microscope, as cool as it might be. They are extremely, extremely small. Uh, they get washed out under the light microscope. They're very difficult to see, um, unless you very specially do what we call flagellar staining. Um, think about flagella staining, like coating the flagella with paint or like mascara. Um, basically, as you coat the flagella, they start to appear larger and larger until eventually you can get them to a point where you can see them. Um, we will not do this in lab. Uh, we test for motility a different way and we eventually will get there. Now, when it comes to movement of bacteria, this is pretty much limited to flagella, okay? Uh, so we're really just talking about flagella. It's, it's commonly the only way bacteria that move, move, okay? Um, like other single-celled organisms, bacteria respond to chemical stimuli, uh, and the response to a chemical stimulus is what we term chemotaxis. Makes great sense. Chemochemical, taxis, movement, so movement based on a chemical. Uh, we see positive and negative chemotaxis, with positive chemotaxis being movement towards a favorable stimulus. So, you know, smelling cookies when you walk in the room has a tendency to get you to sit on the side where the cookies are. Uh, and the negative chemotaxis, basically movement away from a repelling chemical. Uh, so, if I light the worst smelling candle uh, you have ever smelled on one side of the room, chances are a lot of you would start moving away from it. Okay, uh, So <clears throat> you're responding and you have respondent movement to that chemical signal. It just happens to be hitting your olfactory senses instead of the outside of your individual cells. Okay? So 
what we see is that receptors bind extracellular molecules and that starts to flag uh, trigger the flagellum to rotate. Now, this is not a nice smooth directed movement towards or away from a stimulus. Instead, okay, uh, flagella do what is termed a run tumble run where they move forward a little bit okay, but unfortunately their chemical stimulus is over here okay, and to compensate they spin around and move forward a little bit okay, and spin and move forward a little bit spin and eventually get to move into the appropriate direction okay. So run, tumble, run. Okay. Uh, we will also see what are termed periplasmic flagella. Uh, these flagella actually do not stick to the outside of the cell, if you can see here. Uh, these flagella okay, are actually a part of the intracellular structure, or not necessarily intracellular, um, a part of the structure of the outer portion of the cell. Okay? Uh, these are commonly termed axial filaments. And what they do is they're sort of bound to the cell and they run the length of the cell. You can see this happening here. Okay? They're what give the spirochetes their nice corkscrew shape. Okay? And because of the way the periplasmic flagella run and these axial filaments are attached into the cell, uh, they allow the spirochetes to be motile, but they give them sort of a wiggling movement instead of that propeller-like movement. Okay. Uh, like I said, internal flagellum actually ends up being enclosed in between the space, uh, between the cell wall and the cytoplasmic membrane. So it's stuck between the cell wall and the cytoplasmic membrane. Uh, as the bacteria grows, okay, the axial filament doesn't necessarily grow at the same rate. Uh, because of that, we often see the uh, bacteria coiling around the axial filament. So that coiling shape actually has to do with that flagella okay, sort of being stuck okay, in the middle of these cells. So again, another way for the organisms to move, the axial filaments you pretty much exclusively find in spiral bacteria. Uh, this is a flagella that doesn't necessarily extend off of the end, but is causing the cells themselves to wind around the axial filament, making the bacteria this sort of spiraled coarse groove shape. So another external structure, but I want to make a note right here that this is not for motility. Okay. This has nothing to do with movement or what we call pili. Okay. Now there are two types of pili, uh, both of which are made from a monomer called pillin. Okay. Pillin is a protein. Uh, so lots of pillin subunits put together to make pili. Uh, Fenbrae, which are also known as attachment pili, they are actually specifically used for attachment. I always think of them as bacterial Velcro, helping the bacteria hold on to surfaces or other organisms. Again, this is fulfilling a requirement of infection. Can you name which one? If you said establishment, you are correct. Okay. So that's one type. What you see here are attachment pili, okay. these sort of short hair like projections that are coming out of the surface of the cell. There are a bunch of them here, that's why that fading occurs. Uh, there are also what we call conjugation pili. Uh, they're also known as sex pili or F pili. Uh, these are used for attachment, but not necessarily attachment to surfaces. Instead, conjugation pili will attach bacteria to one another and allow for this exchange of genetic information. In other words, they can pass things on from one bacteria to the next. 
uh, the process of attaching with these conjugation pili and moving genetic information from one cell to the next is known as conjugation. Okay? So bacteria participate in conjugation uh, with a conjugation pili. Now, I will go ahead and warn you that your book just refers to these as pili. So this is just pili in your text, and these are known as fimbriae in the textbook. So when it comes to surface coatings, and we still have yet to make it inside of the cell, uh, we see things like surface layers, okay, or an S layer in the glycocalyx. Okay. Uh, an S layer, we see thousands of copies of a single protein uh, where they're all linked together like chain mail. Okay. Uh, S layers are not particularly common, uh, only seen in bacteria when they're in a hostile environment. In other words, the S layer serves a protective function. Uh, these are relatively new discoveries, so we don't know too much about uh, exactly what sort of pops them into being, uh, but we do know that it seems to be hostile environments. Okay. Uh, the glycocalyx, common in almost every single bacteria, uh, this is a coating of repeated polysaccharide and glycoprotein units. The mixture of polysaccharides and glycoproteins depends upon the type of cell. It's actually something that is unique to pretty much every individual cell type. Uh, the glycocalyx comes in two forms, a loose sort of gelatinous layer called a slime layer. Okay. Uh, and the slime layer, a lot of prevention against water loss. Uh, the slime layer will grab nutrients and make sure those nutrients stay in contact with the cell. Okay. Uh, we also do see capsules where those polysaccharides and glycoproteins are more closely bound to the cell, uh, so they're dense. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> what we see here with this denseness is that this often serves a nice protective function, uh, keeping the cell from being digested, uh, sort of protecting the cell from the outside environment. Okay. Uh, both of these are commonly used to do things like avoid phagocytosis. Okay. Uh, if you don't remember, phagocytosis is a very common immune system response where white blood cells engulf invaders. Um, certain cells uh, can avoid phagocytosis uh, for example, not letting the phagocyte itself grab onto the cell, so having the phagocyte uh, attempt to engulf the cell and the cell slips out from the phagocyte. Uh, think about it like trying to grab a wet bar of soap and having it slide out of your hands. Uh, we also see that some slime layers are somewhat sticky and thick, so they help form biofilms. Okay. So they're good for what we term adhesion, where the cells stick together or stick to surfaces. So biofilms, uh, antiphagocytic, okay. if you're antiphagocytic, okay. uh, you'll note that this is a great, great, great example of defeating the host defense, that third requirement, uh, because one of our biggest and most commonly used host defense mechanisms uh, is phagocytosis, okay? macrophages that get rid of invading organisms. It's a very, very common means to, you know, protecting ourselves from invaders. So the cell envelope, okay, uh, what we're saying is this is the surrounding portions of the cytoplasm. It's going to be composed of two or three basic layers. Uh, the cell wall and the cell membrane, both of these are pretty much required. Okay. Uh, the outer membrane depends upon the type of bacteria. Okay. That's your big key right there in some bacteria. I'll go ahead and tell you this is specific to gram-negative organisms and only gram-negative organisms. So a little bit about the cell wall. Okay. Uh, lies outside of the cell membrane. We find it in pretty much all bacteria. It's very rare not to see it in bacteria. 
and it serves two main functions. I always tell people the cell wall does the two S's. It maintains the characteristic shape of the cell, so keeps it a coccus, a bacillus, a vibrio, a spirochete, etc. And provides structural support that prevents the cell from bursting when fluids flow into the cell by osmosis. Okay. So as osmotic pressure starts to build up and we have lots of liquids begin to flow into the cell, uh, that cell wall will prevent the cell from bursting. These are the same functions that cell walls have in cells like plant cells. Okay. Now, what we'll see later is that certain drugs will actually target the cell wall uh, and disrupt the integrity of the cell wall itself. Uh, when the cell wall is weakened, it's much more common to see cells lice. Okay? And as these cells rupture, this destroys all of the infrastructure in the living portions of the cell. Okay? So drugs that very often target cell walls are quite distinct at their ability to kill those cell types. Okay? Uh, I'm going to stop here. We'll start revisiting the cell wall again in the next lecture. Uh, <clears throat> so more on the cell wall, and then we'll start moving into the cell in the next lecture.